And they will start with a short video introduction about the topic. So please roll the film. So today we decided to escalate our Galamse campaign from on-air to off-air. For the past couple of years, we've been doing many reports on air talking about the inimical effects of illegal small-scale mining, the pollution of our water bodies, destruction of farmlands, the denigration of societal values, kids involving in mining and all those things. But we felt that that was good, but people needed to be brought face to face with the Galamse issue. So we've launched the Stop Galamse Now campaign and we've put out five specific demands we want the government to, to do. But what we did was staff of CTFM and some volunteers went out in the morning to distribute leaflets and some t-shirts, essentially for people to see what this Galamse thing is about. It's one thing hearing a radio or TV, watching a TV program talking about Galamse. It's entirely another thing seeing a journalist in the streets, in the hot sun, distributing a leaflet saying that let's get involved. I feel a lot of people are detached from problems. They see it on TV, they express some views, they express an outrage on social media, and that's where it ends. We want people to know that they are personally to be part of what we are doing. So they should get personally involved, talk to somebody, share a leaflet. And that's why we set the example by going out ourselves. So it was very important to do that. This morning on social media, someone asked me why we're making so much noise um, about Galamse and why we're not in the villages talking about it and educating people about it. And I thought that was a very interesting question because I feel like social media um, has a lot, wields a lot of power that a lot of us are yet to realize. Um, each person who uses Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, has one relative in some village somewhere who they can talk to, who they can influence, and who they can tell about the Galamse menace. So we got to start from somewhere. We have to um, begin the conversation and let other people pick it up. And uh, for those of us in the media, that's our job. We have the mouthpiece, we have the opportunity um, to reach millions at a go, and that's Hi. Hello? Hello? Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Philip. Um, I'm here with my colleagues. So just a quick introduction. So my name is Apioko Ashong Abe. My name is Sanders Tate. My name is Nathan Kwao. And my name is AJ Sapon. And we will be speaking about social activism and Ghanaian media, inciting change with digital tools. And we'll just be telling you about some of the work that um, the Ghanaian media have been doing, especially with digital tools, and getting people to stop being on their seats and actually getting into the streets and getting some change that they request for. 
So just a brief history about um, media in Ghana. So prior to 1993, which seems like ages ago, um, there, were only, there was only the state-owned, government-controlled radio television network, which was the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. Um, I always have these very interesting memories of how at 7 o'clock or at 10 o'clock, when the TV or GBC is off, there's no more television for anybody to watch. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, we'll get into that later. For print, however, there was also and still is the Daily Graphic and then the Ghanaian Times. So basically, this is what we used to exist with in terms of access to media. Things have changed, however, um, over the last couple of years. Radio, TV, print have changed remarkably. Currently in Ghana, there are about 354 functioning radio stations. Um, TV, there are 53 which are functioning at the moment. And then there are over 120 registered print media houses with about 45 of them in active circulation. How does it work, basically, for a lot of media houses? It's really, really simple and straightforward. Most of them are owned by politically exposed persons. These are people who either occupy a space have a government appointment or are known to be affiliated with one political party or the other. There's also a conglomerate concept whereby most of the media houses, or some of the media houses are basically affiliated with other businesses owned by some individual or a group of individuals, quite a number of them um, that are currently operating in Ghana. And some of them are also linked very interestingly to financial institutions or the financial sector. So there are banks and there are loan savings and loans companies which basically are connected with you know the media houses. Kind of makes you wonder what sort of stories we'll be getting out of those. Now just a brief run through about what the social media and new media landscape looks like um, in Ghana. As you can see um, there are about the total population in Ghana currently um, estimated is around 29.78 million people. Um, mobile subscriptions obviously are much more than the number of people because people have multiple devices, which I'm guessing is a situation, yeah, as you can see. <laughs> um, basically, the number of internet users right around half of the population, which is 10.32 million. And active social media users are about 5.8 million. And mobile social media users are about 5.4, so kind of tells you what the spread looks like. Now, the annual growth, and this is very interesting when you look at what has happened over the course of just about a year, this, these stats give you a sense of just how active people have been on social media. And, and the next slides would give you a better sense and better context of why this particular slide is very important. Now, as you can see, the most active um, social media users, or the audience, is, are those between the ages of 18 and 24 and the ages of 25 and 34. Now, if some of you were at the international space a couple of days ago, you would have heard that quite a number of students are graduating almost every day, about 70,000 and over, are graduating every year from our universities. Now, 90% of them have to wait between one year and 10 years to get active, gainful employment. The other 10 have to figure themselves out and usually get around to either entrepreneurship or whichever one it is. So what it basically means is people between the ages of 18 and 34, half of them or probably even more of them are unemployed and basically waiting around for something to do or looking for something to do. And it can get very dangerous, but it depends on what the rest of the society does in sort of shaping these groups of people. Now, these are the most common platforms um, that people use or tend to use in terms of the dissemination of information and interaction. Of course, WhatsApp will always be at the top, followed by Facebook and the rest of them. Now, these are the new players, and uh, my colleagues will also run through some of the new players. AJ? 
Alrighty, so mobile TV. Now we're getting to a point in Ghana that a lot of people are on the go, on the move, and cannot sit in front of their television. So a lot of media houses are now putting their content on um, easy to go uh, well, online platforms. Uh, we as City have a very active Facebook where we stream all our content live on it as well on YouTube and a few other social media platforms and as well we have an app where people can tune in and watch all of this. Uh, Abiyoko will go on with the rest. Okay, so if we, again, you look at integrated new media platforms, City FM, City TV, we have very active Twitter, very active Instagram, very active Facebook. So whatever you're hearing on the radio, whatever you're seeing on TV, be it mobile or traditional, you're also seeing that on your timeline. We also um, sort of consolidate all our news items throughout the day and share them as WhatsApp blast. So people have access on the go. And if you talk about effective outdoor engagement, in Ghana we like to say media people are celebrities. Because we have a voice that a lot of people don't have. And we have access to the discerning people, especially for a media house like ours that is English speaking and the leading English speaking media house in Ghana. So you have access to people who listen. So we become like celebrities. I mean, if we're on the streets of Ghana, of Accra, you see like, people will be swarming over us, you know. But um, that's important because it means that people want to meet you. They feel as if they know you. And so we have all these events that allow people to come to us and sometimes tell you problems that they might not necessarily be able to say over the radio, on a phone call, or send you in a WhatsApp message. They want to tell you personally. And these elder engagements give us the opportunity to do that. And also to meet communities of people that we probably wouldn't know of if we're just sitting behind a microphone or in front of a camera. Okay, so Na um, Sandy, Nathan, maybe Sandy, social media. Um, so when we speak about coordinated social media strategy, so we're thinking 360. Um, wherever it is that the audience is, we will go there. So as AJ mentioned, if we do have an audience interested in our app, definitely we need to package content and send something there for them. If it is Twitter, they are on. If it's Facebook, wherever it is. And WhatsApp is just tremendous. You know, we have all of these WhatsApp groups. And what we try to do is we just put the news plus the links to our website because sometimes someone might not have been on Facebook all day. Not on Twitter, not on Instagram. But WhatsApp, surely, definitely, you will get them there. So it's a 360 thing. Whatever it is that the media seeks to tell the public, to campaign for, to change, we just make sure we are on all the platforms where we can find the people that we want to change something about or we want to incite them to make some kind of change. We don't leave anything out. So, I mean, on the issue of understanding new media audience metrics, it's also very important that you change with the times. If your metrics suggest to you that more people are engaging with you on Facebook as compared to Twitter, then you have to necessarily change your strategy to align with distributing content on the platforms that are most engaging, at least for your audience. Now, these are some of the strategies that we typically tend to use. So most of them are media-led activism, which we'll be getting into quite a number of them. There's media support for community-led activism as well. So if a community or we realize that a community is very passionate about something, it typically tend to send us a text message or a WhatsApp message. What we tend to do is to sort of go ahead with them and help them sell their message to the rest of the world, especially if it's something that we believe in. We constantly ask questions because that is our job. We analyze as well. We have quite a number of documentaries that we produce on almost a weekly or monthly basis. We also have a number of special reports that we put together and then we have editorials and then a number of online campaigns, social media and infographics, some of which you'll be seeing in just a few minutes. So exactly who are we? Um, Nathan? Well, I mean, we've already introduced ourselves, but yeah, we work with uh, City FM and City TV now. These are the platforms across which we work, on TV, on radio, and online. So if you visit citynewsroom.com, you'll find all the things we do there, be it a campaign to get something changed, a topical story, a video, a documentary, all the things that are available for us to push a message across to, to get that change. Because Ghana is, is such a country that if you don't shake the authorities, things won't get done. And these are the platforms in which we 
put out our message, we hold authority to account, and we demand the things they are expected to give us as a citizen. And people sometimes bring out their, their queries, their issues. We channel them through these platforms, TV, radio, online, and then we engineer the change we, we like to see in our society. So let's get to some of the activism that we've been very um, much engaged with. Um, just enjoy this very quick video and then we'll come back to the issues. Because they will be or are full educated. So on your money, just our bar, Galamsey, I say, but will be our bonny degree. So now on I'm so sorry, or yes, I to 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 no, a Jumani be, yeah, dear, no, yes, I buy us. Because any any part back of for the money, do any part or or the money be free. Any back of the money, the money is dust. Until any any is happy as it. Any any wah, but Uncle Four or Moko down on the ground. Moko ano Moko two bo baro. No mo di aba. On ba na yansu ya jo. Any any po ye ye position ye bo ni se ye jo. Ye jo bo baro mo ye smut. Ye smut amu wasia ni aji esika. No, <laughs> No, what do I had a good in an incassano? We have a responsibility to pass on to the next generation water bodies that are better than we met them, not worse than we met them. So that was my understanding. Secondly, go back into history. Where gold was prevalent in the Ashanti region, Eastern region, Western region, folklore has it that our ancestors prevented mining in water bodies. They simply said that mining was not allowed in water bodies because they knew the importance of water bodies. I mean, you see, it's about, about, about leadership, it's about persons, it's about attitude. Inosa is no longer the ministry. There's a minister there. His attitude, well view, I mean, perception of the problem might be different from Inosa. His understanding of it might be different from Inosa. His understanding of the policy imperatives might be different. His understanding of the priorities might be different. So that was um, a video that, as part of the campaigns that we're doing on Stop Galamsey Now, that was one of the, just one of the videos that we put out. We put out a number of videos, we did a number of campaigns. But some of these videos were responsible for getting governments to take action eventually. So why did we start this campaign? Well, our river bodies and our water bodies were basically being destroyed, literally, like every second. People 
will not have access to drinking water. The government was forced to, for example, um, the Ghana Water Company was forced to introduce more chemicals to make the water safer, which eventually doesn't make the water safer because of the number of chemicals. Just, it was really a scary time for us. Um, of course, long-term damage to farmlands, as you probably already know. Um, Ghana, like a lot of other African countries, very agriculture-based economy. And so all of this Galam Sea work basically did destroy a lot of farmlands. The impact on the environment was just, was just sad, was immense. And of course, it cost the economy quite a lot because if the government is spending so much money trying to treat the water, trying to treat all the sick people, trying to stop the Galam Sea in itself, quite a number of money or a lot of amount of money has to go into that and can't be channeled elsewhere. For example, the building of roads and other facilities and amenities. Lots of livelihoods were lost because of the destruction to the environment. If a farmer doesn't have access to his land anymore, how does he feed his family, for example? Not just that, quite a number of people lost their lives as well because the mines are not properly protected. They don't have any standards. Basically, someone wakes up one morning, picks up um, a shovel and starts digging in his house. Goes deep enough. If he finds gold, he pay pay. If he doesn't, he just moves to another house and then tries his luck there. And it just basically went on and on and on. Now, this is basically showing you um, a bit of evidence of um, what actually um, the situation was. As you can see there, um, in, in this, this is basically the river body. River... Rivers typically are supposed to be a lot clearer than that, but because of the mining or the illegal mining activities, that's basically what you have there. These are some of the very industrious Chinese persons who came into the country, aided, of course, by locals um, with their machines, destroying the environment, destroying the water bodies. Now, when you look over here, this is um, a bottle containing water before and during the period when the, um, the Galamse activity was happening. And that over there is after the months of advocacy work, after the months of continuous um, activism, basically from media houses in Ghana. There was actually a coalition that was formed to fight against Galamse. And so, as you can see there clearly, now, I don't know how many of you can drink water from here, but I'm guessing we'll be a little more comfortable if we drank water from this one. That's just to paint the reality for you. So what did exactly did we do? These are some of the infographics and some of the things that we did. Um, as you can see here, we issued, um, we had these leaflets that were going around, as we showed you in the video earlier, with um, our demands from government, as you can see over there. Um, we also indicated how exactly Garamse was affecting our communities and um, everything else. Now, we also went onto the streets and tried to make it um, as in your face as possible. So as you can see there, we had some of these individuals painted um, on the streets, just basically sending the message across. Now, when you typically see red, you know it's um, a sign of danger. Something needs to be done drastically. And um, we're hoping that these persons, as part of all the activity and all the leaflets distribution in town, will help to drive the message forward. So there's a timeline of how everything basically panned out. Um, as you can see, on March 29th, the Lands Ministry issued a three-week ultimatum to illegal miners. This is after all the advocacy work that we did. Um, five Chinese and five Ghanaians were arrested on March 31st. City FM, which is our radio station, launched the Stop Galamse Now campaign. Now, what's interesting is that we had been talking about the Galamse menace three years before all of this happened. And so you can just imagine just how much damage had been done to the environment. Um, in April, four Chinese and three Ghanaians were arrested. In April, again, two days after, four Chinese or illegal um, miners were arrested, weapons seized. Um, the Chief Justice designed 14 courts specifically and exclusively to deal with the Galamse cases. The Lands Ministry in April or on April 14th, announced a voluntary surrender of some um, mining equipment. And then the Vice President on April 17th announced a suspension of the issuance of small-scale mining licenses. And eventually, on April 19th, um, a ministerial task force on Galamse um, basically was put in place. 
um, an Operation Vanguard, which was um, um, a joint police and military task force, was also put together, sent to the various regions and areas where a lot of this mining was happening, and basically drove the message home. And that is how far we've come. Unfortunately, it sometimes feels today as if the battle is lost because of weariness and a number of things that we'll discuss later, but that is basically what the potential of media taking up activism can do. All right, so we're going to move to the next one, uh, UGMC and Abandoned Project. So um, many Ghanaians lose their lives every year because of inadequate health structure. Our health structure uh, leaves a lot to be wanting. So in January 2018, uh, City FM as a unit led by our morning show decided to research into how bad the issue was. So in Ghana, we have a lot of abandoned projects. So everywhere you go to, you see either an abandoned market, uh, a hospital, some building or the other that the government had contracted at some point and just never got finished. So we decided to see how bad the issue is, and this is what we found. So we realized that as a country, we have spent $1 billion on hospitals alone, not operating hospitals. That's how much we spent. So we started off with uh, the where we started really advocating for is a hospital called UG Medical Center. So the University of Ghana Medical Center, it was completed in 2017 at the cost of $217 million and was not working. 18 months after, we were still wondering why is this hospital not opened? 20, uh, 36 million was spent on a Bank of Ghana hospital, was completed in 2017 and not operational. Also, uh, $860,000 was spent on a digital village in Volu in the Volta region, which at, as a region doesn't have that many hospitals, yet $860,000 was spent on it and was also not working. $23 million on a maritime hospital in Tema, completed in 2016 and still not working. $175 million was spent uh, on a district hospital project. So this is where medical um, facilities are set up in places where uh, in the relevant districts are not available. So it was spent in the Sekandi, Takradi municipality, the Abitifi district, the Guru Tempani district, the Kamu, uh, sorry, Kumewu district and uh, the Formina district. 175 million was spent on different hospitals and was not operational. 686 million was spent on a Eurojet hospital project and was expected to be open in 2017 and all of them at varying stages of completion and they still hadn't been done. Their timelines had passed and the hospitals were just sitting there accumulating dust. Some of them had weeds overtaking the property and this was money that had been spent but there was no way to use the facilities that were allegedly um, spent on. So this led into even more activism because at a point in time, a certain gentleman passed on. So uh, a 70 year old man was feeling ill and was taken to seven dif different hospitals and all these hospitals decided that they don't have a bed and they will not take him in, even though it was an emergency situation. So the, at the final hospital, the man died and it became a very big heated um, discussion about how we can let citizens die. And he's not the only one actually to have died. It's a series of events that led to that particular moment. So also with City, we did a research and realized that 29 million Ghanaians share only 55 ambulances. So usually what happens when you're ill or you have an emergency or an accident is you're put in a taxi and then you're taking to the hospital. That is if there's a hospital around you in the first place. Unfortunately, you can drive around a lot without even getting an emergency uh, first aid or anything of that sort. And most often than not, people die. I'll give you two examples. So our immediate vice president, uh, Parkwe Siemi Sartha, God rest his soul, um, after a morning session at the gym, passed uh, out and before he could be taken to the hospital, again, in his car, he died. Our, uh, our president, um, Professor John Evans Atamills, also had uh, passed out in the Osu car, so that's a seat of power then, and was put in a car and couldn't get to the hospital in time, and he also passed on. We had another senior presidential advisor, uh, P.V. Obing, who also had an asthmatic attack, and in his car, was moved into a taxi and before he could get into the hospital, had died. That's how bad the situation is. So 155 ambulances in Ghana 
generally, but only 55 are operational. So we have the ambulances, uh, even just 55 of them are actually working. So the disparity and the unfortunate part is, even if you decide that, okay, after the 55, I would take one of them, you still have to pay. And you'd have to pay for even petrol to be fueled for you to be able to get to a place. There's a situation where one woman in labor, uh, actually the hospital called for the ambulance. The ambulance didn't get there for about five hours. Uh, they decided to put her in a taxi. It's a dire situation, but before she could get to the next hospital, had died and her baby had died as well. So that's how bad the situation was. So we decided to uh, try and get some action on it. So City FM, as a unit, along with a civil organization called Occupy Ghana, decided to petition the president, uh, Nanako Fodo, to check uh, the situation and then also ask that we institute an emergency health care system where if I decide that I am sick or I have an accident or any one of us, then you would get emergency help. One thing, one situation is my own uncle, he's a dentist and he worked in the Kolib, one is that's one of our biggest hospitals, and had an actual emergency situation. And even though he worked in the hospital, couldn't get a bed and he also died. So it all of us it touched everyone in a separate way and uh, you know that as you're walking around and you have an emergency, most often than not, if you're not close to uh, a hospital, you're likely to die. So it, everyone took it upon themselves to be able to try and get some action out of the government. Well, good news is the presidency replied to it, responded to it and set out targets or um, action plan on how they were going to institute it. They said they were going to import ambulances, which they have, 275 have arrived in the country. They're yet to operationalize it. And as well, we have, uh, they've given out timelines. The time, some of the timelines have passed, but <laughs> the president in his last State of the Nation address in February stated that it will be done and the abandoned projects all across the country will be concluded. So we'll be keeping an eye out on that one. So the initial situation that started it off was the UGMC. That's a $217 million institution that was not operationalized. So we kept on hammering on it so much that after 18 months, the government finally gave in and opened the institution. Take a look. In why? Interim Chairman of the Management Committee, Dr. Anefi Asamoah Ba, explains. This is not your ordinary hospital. In fact, this is meant to be the highest referral center in the country. So the teaching hospitals are even expected to refer cases to this facility. So it is important that this facility is not swamped or inundated with conditions that can be managed in other facilities. Okay, so to the next thing or another example of how the media has been able to lead campaigns, has been able to get out of the newsroom and instead of reporting, rather becoming the story, has to do with the right to information. So um, since 1999, Ghana actually has, a right, has had a right to information bill before parliament, but it was never passed. So that's where the conversation is going to go now. Now, somewhere in 2014, as a student reporter, I interviewed this journalist, Heather Brooke. Now, for those of you who are into UK politics or know a bit about Heather and the work she did with um, the UK parliamentary expenses scandal, she was able to break the news, or let's say expose the fact that taxpayers' money were being misused by some MPs, and that led to politicians resigning and whatnot. And so meeting her at school, she did mention the fact that her work would not have been possible if the UK didn't have their Freedom to Information Act, or let's say operational at that time, because that's what gave her the, the impetus, or let's say, ability to walk into an institution and demand for information to be able to do her research and then come up with the, the findings. So, I come from a country, Ghana, where we have democracy. The press is free. As at uh, 2015, we rank 22nd um, on um, the world press freedom you know, rankings out of 180 countries. And in such a country, you would expect that we should be able to have the right to walk into a public institution and ask for information about our politicians or how our monies are being used. And even at that time, we ranked higher 
than the United States, France, and I think the UK in terms of press freedom. And we've basically maintained that the 20s, actually, making us like one of the, the leading free press in, in Africa. So you might think that we should have our RTI, you know, functional, you know, in full effect and everything, but no, Ghana didn't have that. And Ghana, we're so free that, you know, sometimes people say our freedom is even a threat onto us because everybody speaks their mind. So there's a spin on the word democracy, which says democracy, meaning everybody is talking at the same time. Everybody has the right to talk. So suddenly everybody has gone crazy. So that, that, that's just the country that Ghana is. But yet, we didn't have RTI in effect for like 19 years, since 1999. So um, basically, I just look at the government's response to the RTI bill as too long, didn't read it because they were not doing anything. It's been there for like 18, 19 years. What have they been doing with it? Nothing. So, yes. Um, if, if you see the posture of the politicians, I mean, some of the things they said about the RTI bill is we can't pass RTI bill this year due to you know, fi financial challenges. Some will say we should consider our security before we pass that bill. Others will say, well, you know, journalists have misplaced priorities. We should focus on other things. So many excuses why somebody cannot just walk into a public institution and say, show me how my money is being spent. Show me how my taxpayer's money has been used to do this or that. So finally, I think the media, we got fed up. Okay, and um, we formed coalitions. I mean, there was an existing coalition years ago, but the recent ones, I think, had more success because of how much digital tools were deployed in the campaigns. And that's a fact. So there was a coalition for the media. There was also another coalition. I mean, we got about 20 civil society organizations involved in this, you know, to, 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 to try to push for change. Now, you might ask, what were we doing? Like, what did we do? What were the tools and everything? So, we basically just ganged up. That's the coalition we formed. We got some superhero costumes. You'll see photos very soon. <laughs> and then we created a hashtag, pass the RTI bill now. And then, of course, lots of selfies and photographs. Other photographs, yes. And that campaign was called the Red Friday. So when I was talking about the... Um, the superhero costumes, I was basically referring to red. So people in media, people who worked in press, every Friday or designated Fridays would wear red tops or red clothing, okay? And then we'll show up at work and we'll keep chanting, pass the RTI bill now. And that's what we did persistently. And so the hashtags and the selfies have the power if you still use it. They still do have power. And we, it was not just about photography, of course. Infographics are very popular in Ghana, so we always use infographics to give people an understanding of where we are and where we're going, what they need to know. So we also employ the use of arts. Artists in Ghana are very political. I mean, I think it's like that around the world. They have a voice, so in their arts. And as you can see here, our government is very insistent on everybody getting tin numbers to pay tax, pay tax, pay tax. So the artwork you see there is trying to ask, well, we've been paying tax. What have you been using our tax money for? We want to know. And then the government sits on that and says, it's a secret. So people created artwork through that. We were getting our message across. So of course, we took to the streets. Once again, we came out of the newsrooms and we went to the streets. We are distributing flyers, telling people that, hey, RTI will help us fight corruption, will help us know what is being done behind our backs in, 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 in all government's offices and everything. So join the campaign, help us. So in that, we took photographs, and these are staff of a media house or a media organization, yes, Media, media Foundation West Africa, wearing their red on a typical Friday, taking selfies, just making more noise about RTI. And then we are also trolling the president. We don't, just, <laughs> we don't just, you know, take selfies and everything. People would, you know, just, yeah, tweet, just tag him in there and say, hey, happy Sunday, Mr. President. I'm up and waiting for you. What's the status of the RTI bill? So, yes, we, we, we just wouldn't stop. We just wouldn't stop. 
The tweets, the hashtags, the selfies still have the power if you use it. And then because this campaign was really close to the media, I mean, people would, can wash their hands off it and say, you know, the media, they have all the power, they have everything, they have the voice, they have the radio stations, they have the, the TV stations, the social media platforms, let them do their own thing. But no, we were able to get ordinary people in the streets to help us hold up the placards and, and you know, take the photos because they are also voters. The government knows that they are voters. So the government seeing these pictures running around on social media know that, okay, so it's not just the media doing the talking, now they've gotten the buy-in of the citizens. And that relationship has been, I would say, reciprocal because we help the citizens make their points. I mean, when people want to protest, we cover the protest, give the protest, protest mileage, and let more people hear about it. So now it was our turn to fall on the citizenry to say, guys, we really want this bill passed. Could you also help us? So yes, that, that, though it was started by the media, we, we did reach out to ordinary people to help us do this. So, um, you know, there, there are times where in Ghana, when there's a scandal or news breaks or something, it's very difficult to get a politician to speak to the issue. The only time they want to speak to the issue is when they realize that the narrative is shifting somewhere that they don't want. So sometimes, they're actually calling into the radio programs and they will say, hey, we just had something, can we say something too? You know? And there are days where you want to call them or speak to them, they'll be like, eh, no, we can't talk. So RTI for us is a way to stop all the playing of games, to stop the politicians from feeding us crumbs so that we can just do our work as media, free and, and easily. So finally, RTI was passed in March this year, it paid off. <laughs> so, yeah, all, all, the, all the tweeting, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing because years ago, there were coalitions trying to do this. But now, just because word got around, social media did its magic, it's, it's been passed. And the way forward for us is to just make sure that journalists are equipped to be able to make use of the RTI. Because you can walk into an institution, they will dump all the papers on you and tell you you have just five hours to photocopy all of them or whatever. How do you sift through the data? How are you able to make sense of what you're seeing, analyze it and make sure that you are telling good stories or important stories? And I think that we are still going to fall back on digital tools to do this. We, are still, have to, we, we still have to learn certain computer um, programming languages Python, I know, data analysis, sift through the data. We have to be able to learn to visualize stories properly so that at the end of the day, we don't just have a bill that is not being used, but we have a bill that, um, an act now that we can go fetch the information, come and do something useful with it, interpret it, allow you know, our digital audiences to look at it on their phones, feed it to them through their apps and whatnot, and then we'll be able to make change in our society. So that's just how much, through the tweets, through the hashtags, and the mundane things like selfies, was able to get the right um, to information bill made into an act in Ghana just this year. Ninety-seven point three City FM, relevant radio, always. My name is Samuel. As a media guy, yesterday I come and visit my mom. Like, we are like, you know, the rain starts for us, so I can't feed you. Yesterday, the tea I see for here is very bad because of the. We experienced this thing before, now we don't explain, like, yesterday one is happening. We don't explain that sort of thing. I'm from Ankara Sioux. I'm a pure water business seller. I sell pure water. This is exactly four years. I I, I faced the same problem. And today too. At first it was only the rain. But it's the second time. The second time is in, uh, fire and rain. All my property are gone. I'm 
So those were visuals from the June 3rd disaster, which happened a couple of years ago, 2015. And from that incident, over 150 people basically lost their lives. Hundreds were injured and millions in terms of property were destroyed. Now, it was just basically an issue of drainage and still is an issue of drainage because the floods still happen. So what did we do? We decided to do what we do best, which is everything from writing of articles to starting campaigns, as you can see here from Joy FM, which is also one of the media houses, major media houses in Ghana. And we basically just took it to the government. We demanded from the government to do something about it. Now, typically, they should eventually when the people decide to speak up much more, but not much was done. So this time around, we tried a different approach, which is working with civil society organizations to try to push the message further. And this is one of the civil society organizations that we work with, One Ghana Movement. Now, through One Ghana Movement's activities and help, we were able to serve a demand notice to the Goyal filling station and then the National Petroleum Authority, who were very integral to um, the incident of the day. Now, Goyal still claims that it was a natural disaster, but then all the evidence that has been put forward so far suggests that it was just pure negligence. We've also been able to serve demand notices to the Accra Metropolitan Assembly and the case currently is in court. We're also seeking justice and compensation for all the affected persons just because of our collaboration with civil society organizations. And that basically is it. So next thing, tramadol. Does anyone know what tramadol is? Painkiller, very powerful painkiller. Okay, it's very popular in Ghana, much of West Africa. We went to a rally at a uh, trade fair. Mm. Uh, on our way coming back, and we had an accident. I was on a motorbike. So an iron went straight into my hands in 2016. 2016? Yeah, December. Stone Boy is the, the biggest fan. I like him, Ghana. The best artist. Yeah, it has a lot of side effects. You'll be addicted. If you don't get it, you'll be falling down. Yeah. Because you feel it. And you, you'll be stiff and you'll fall down. Unless they pour water on you. Okay, so tramadol, you, I mean, basically, like I said, painkiller, but much more powerful than a paracetamol or a Tylenol or a Brufen. It's usually given when somebody has chronic pain that is unbearable, and so it should be a prescription drug. The problem is that in Ghana, you can get it without a prescription, not just in a pharmacy, but on the streets. And it's not just available to adults. You have children as young as 13, 12, also having access to this drug, and it gives a high and you know what comes with drug abuse, mental um, you know, issues in the long run. And again, we don't have a very you know, well-structured mental health facility in Ghana, or mental health structure. And that means that if that happens to your child or to you as an adult, chances are your life is ruined forever. And so this is a campaign that um, a sister station, GH1, also in the media, really took to heart. And a particular presenter or media personality, Nanaba Namwa, she was really, really big on this so she was going into the communities and these are urban communities we have lots of slums what happens in Ghana is that um, development is not well distributed across the country so unless you're in the business center Accra or maybe a Kumasi or a Tamale chances are that you're not getting access to great facilities so people troop to Accra in search of greener pasture so it's a huge mi internal migration issue they don't have the money to you know get access to great um, you, um, in terms of housing, the things they need to survive. Even food is a problem sometimes. And we've already talked about how unemployment is a general issue. So 
graduated, people have graduated from the universities don't have jobs. They have people who don't have much education who are also looking for jobs. How do they get jobs? So they end up in these slums that keep springing up and that is where, unfortunately, this drug is, is, is most you know, popular. So these kids here, a lot of them are addicted. Um, so we started, the, the hashtag began, end tramadol abuse with GH1, and the media just jumped on it. Um, our own media house, we had people talking about it, doing feature reports, going into some of these slums um, where you found the kids, young people, into the universities even, where apparently students were also taking it to deal with their studies and the challenges they were having in school. And again, I say there are no access to psychologists to speak to, counselors, so and the, I mean, African parents want you to bring home good grades, end of story. So it's not everything you can talk to your parents about. And the drug became their safe space. And you have people responding on social media. Um, you know, a lot of people shocked. Um, some people were reformed through the experience. Uh, people are tweeting at the president, at the vice president, at the, the first lady, the second lady, people who are powerful in society. Just an amazing time. And you know, um, it, before this, the, um, if you look to the far um, right, you see that what happened was that there was a national forum that came out of this. Finally, the government came out, the Food and Drug Authority came out, the Medical and Dental Council came out, and they said, you know what, let's talk about this, let's see what we can do because it's hurting our young people. And then finally, what happened? The health ministry banned not just tramadol or restricting access to tramadol, but banning coding cough syrups. Because through this campaign, we learned that that was another thing that people were using to cope with their issues. So now the Food and Drugs Authority in Ghana, you know, came up with this. So they banned coding cough syrups and then they restricted access to tramadol. So now, if you need to get some tramadol, you need a proper prescription from a licensed health professional power of social media and digital tools. Yeah, so um, in addition to uh, some of the things that the media house will drive, there are some of the um, other things that we help the communities to do. I think we skipped that. So um, other things like um, matter of the footbridge in Adenta. And Adenta is a part of our crowd. What actually caused this was that on, on a particular highway, there was no footbridge, and people had to cross with cars running at full speed. Somebody got knocked down, the person died. The citizens got very upset. They rioted, burnt tires all over the place until government responded now. There's a footbridge there. On the Tema motorway, for example, the motorway is in a very bad condition. Now the users got upset. Now, to cross the motorway, you need to pay a toll as you enter. And if you are exiting, you pay another toll. Now, on one morning, the users of the road said, you know what, we won't pay anymore because we are paying, the roads are bad, we're having accidents, there are no lights. So it was a very big issue. They said they would not pay the tolls until government did something. And then uh, the last one, bring back our girls. Now, in the western part of Ghana, in the last few months or in the last few years, incidences of kidnapping of girls had become very prevalent. We are still dealing with one major case. Now, because of that case, the media house started a campaign, bring back our girls, forcing government to follow up on where these girls were, prosecuting the, the perpetrators of the crime if they were found, and ensuring that, you know, would have a response. Because even though this matter is still not resolved, we still need to drum home the message. And these are things that the citizens have done. And the media, together with our digital tools, are helping them get um, responses from government. But it's not been smooth. There are challenges. Now, the biggest challenge we faced is that government sometimes won't do anything. You will talk, you will write, you will put out your infographics, do your reports, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, and government still won't follow. And you have to keep talking, you have to keep talking, leading to sometimes the story being monotonous, because every morning you have to say the same thing. The other challenge we faced is with partisan politics and interests. Now, remember the video we watched on the illegal mining? Remember we saw some Chinese people there? Now, these days, most governments in Africa are very good friends with the Chinese government. Now, if there are Chinese people in Ghana doing what is wrong, the government is in a bit of a fix. Now, do they go after the Chinese people and risk incurring the wrath of the Chinese government whose money they want, or they allow the people to do what they want? Because if we go after them, the Chinese government gets upset. So that's a very big challenge. You are dealing with a matter, but government will look at its own diplomatic interests, financial interests, and say, you know what? I can't do anything. 
Because if I buy the hand that is giving me money, we are not getting anything. So there's that. And the third challenge is the disconnection of the middle class. Now, in every society, you have those at the very top, the middle, and the end. Now, in Ghana, the people in the middle class are those who are largely well off. They are fine. They don't have too many issues with electricity, water, whatever. Unfortunately, those same people are the ones who are very good friends with the politicians, the policy makers, the people who can make things happen. Now, because they feel comfortable, they've checked out and they've left everybody to their fate. They have the power to push and to make things happen. If they are disconnected, a lot of the noise gets into a vacuum. There's nobody getting to government or there's nobody prompting government informally because maybe the person is a minister's friend. When that person talks, the minister might listen. But he's checked out. He doesn't care. He lives in a plush part of Accra and he's okay. And then you ask yourself, how much is too much? For how long will you keep talking about one thing whilst there are a million other problems to handle? So it's always a challenge we face. And then a lack of generosity is an interest. Sometimes you are pushing something for a group of people and they don't even care. Because they are dealing with the basic bread and butter issue. Somebody wants money to buy food, he wants water, he wants lights. He's not seeing the bigger picture of, say, stop tramadol abuse or bring back our girls or stop galam. Say It doesn't affect him or her. So you have people not being too tuned into what you are trying to push and sometimes it won't get you where you want to go. And then, um, yeah, the way forward, well, we've got to keep pushing. We can't stop. Government will listen, government will not. We have to keep pushing. The other thing is to keep the message fresh. Always give something new. It creates the illusion of having a new message. And then people will jump onto it. The newer the message, the more followers it will get. And then when you have a good number of people catching on, you are very sure that government will get a response. Of course, government commitment to results, you want that. You want the citizens to own their problems, be at the forefront of the drive, partner with the media to make it happen. And of course, education. People need to be educated. People need to understand the things they are facing. They need to understand their country. They need to understand their situation. If they do that, they will better own. And then when media artists own digital tools and we push a campaign, it's us and the citizenry to get government to do what we want or the government to do what must be done. Because we signed a social contract. I gave you a vote to sit in parliament or to become a minister. You need to make things work for me because that was the deal. Once I give you that, you give me what is due me as a citizen. So we feel that if we keep doing this, we marry them with the right digital tools, great use of the internet, great use of great writing, everything put together, we feel that we can advocate more and cause greater social change in, in Ghana. Right, so um, I'm sure everybody here knows about Christian Amambos. Of, of the CNN. Recently, she's been talking a lot about the media's commitments, like where our priorities lie, and it's, is it about being neutral? As in, we just go out there, be in the field, or in the newsrooms, and we are just doing our work as reporters, or it's, 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 our, it's our commitment, rather, to the truth. She says she, she would rather go for being truthful and not neutral. And whenever I think about this, I just come to a place where I interpret it as, that's my own understanding of it as well as, you know, we don't have to always stay in the newsroom and just say, let's report what one side is saying, let's report the other as is. Sometimes we can also go out there in the streets and be part of the story because we have the information, we have the tools to interpret that information. We have all of these resources at our disposal as media houses. So we can join the advocacy anytime we feel like it. That is what I think. I mean, of course, there will be um, critics who have other things, um, other opinions. But I think in Ghana, that's what we do there now. Because we know we are the agents of change. And so we need to come out of the newsroom and do some of these things ourselves. Um, a city, usually, when we are having our news meetings usually we start by saying okay this program comes next what are we going to talk about on there what are we telling the people this and that but now we can actually sit down and have a conversation to say today in Ghana in Accra what are we changing we are no longer just 
putting stories together or plotting news programs or documentaries or features. We are starting with this very essential, basic, primary question. What are we changing today? What are we changing this week? What are we changing this month? What are we changing this year? So, yes, that's how we move from just being neutral to actually addressing the truth. And the truth is, we need help. We need to get things done. We should get out there. Thank you. So, for unfortunately, uh, time's up for questions, but uh, we'll be at the RP corner in the next stage. So, feel free to ask all your questions at the international space when we're done. Thank you. Thank you. A big round of applause for a great talk. We will not be able to do it.